everybody. Um, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the Associate Director for the Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern Studies here at NYU. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our penultimate uh, event for the Digital Forays and Middle Eastern Studies uh, series this year. Uh, and we have a, an excellent uh, lineup of speakers today to address the future of digital research in, on, and from uh, the Middle East. Uh, I'm gonna just briefly introduce the event and our speakers, uh, and uh, we'll get things started in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, uh, I wanna thank uh, our co-sponsors for today's event, uh, folks at 19 Washington Square North, the Abu Dhabi Institute, Hayan, you're here. Uh, thank you very much for helping us out with this. And then also uh, our colleagues at the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle Eastern Studies, uh, they've been a consistent co-sponsor on many of our events this year. And uh, if you're joining us from that community, uh, welcome. Uh, I uh, also want to note uh, off the top here, we had originally hoped to have Farah Saldahta here uh, to join us for this event, but uh, due to an unforeseen circumstance, uh, he won't be able to join us. Um, we have a, an excellent substitute that I'll get to in a second, but uh, I'm very glad. Uh, uh, we're sorry we, we couldn't have uh, Farah here with us uh, today. Uh, and hopefully uh, he'll be able to join us at a future event. Um, today's uh, event uh, brings together some uh, senior scholars in the field of Middle Eastern studies whose work uh, has uh, uh, revolved around or has dealt significantly with uh, digital projects and, and the digital humanities and Middle Eastern studies. And we've effectively asked them to come and speak with us uh, about the state of uh, digital scholarly research uh, on, in, and from uh, the Middle East. Um, if you go to our website, you'll see a fuller abstract, but this is, this is really going to be a conversation about um, the, the state of the field, what are its major challenges, what are the boundaries, uh, what, what uh, projects do we have to keep an eye out for, and what uh, forum can, kinds of fora, fora can we build uh, going into the future, uh, thinking about doing uh, Middle Eastern studies in a digital world, which has been a major theme of this uh, series throughout the year. Uh, so very briefly, I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, you'll see fuller bios in the chat. Uh, we're going to turn over to each of them uh, for about 10 minutes to stake their claims, put some meat on the table, uh, and then we'll turn over to our uh, discussant who is going to uh, facilitate about 30 minutes of discussion between uh, the three panelists. And at, after that point, we will move on uh, to an open Q&A from uh, the audience. You may at any point uh, enter a question into the chat or a comment. Uh, we're happy to uh, take those, field them, curate them, and relay them back to our panelists at, at the appropriate time. Or you'll be able to... Um, raise your hand and, and ask a question verbally uh, at that time. Uh, so without any further ado, our, our first speaker today is going to be Akram Khater, who is a professor of history at, and, at North Carolina State University and also the director of the Khair Allah Center in Diaspora Studies. Uh, it's in that capacity that we, we've asked him to talk about some of the amazing digital research that uh, is, is being conducted at that center. Our second speaker, is Marina Rusto, the Khadori el uh Professor of Jewish Civilization and Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University uh, and Director of the Princeton Geniza Lab, another very uh, important and prominent uh, Mid Middle Eastern digital humanities project. Uh, and our third speaker is David Joseph Risley, uh, who is a comparative medievalist and digital humanist based in uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, and is going to be speaking to us about uh, several of the projects that he is involved with there. Uh, lastly, our discussant today uh, is our own uh, Jared McCormick, who is the uh, Director of Graduate Studies and Acting Director of the Kevorkian Center. I would just want to take a, a quick moment to embarrass him and thank him uh, for putting this series together and the sort of Herculean uh, work that he has been able to take up over the course of the last year uh, as our Acting Director. Uh, this series, this event, and everything else has, that's been part of it uh, has been his brainchild, uh, and it's you know, grown out of discussions that uh, he has been prompting amongst all of us here at the Kevorkian Center over the last, I would say, year and a half. Uh, 
So we're very, very thankful uh, for, for his energy that he's brought here. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he's able to step in and, and have a little bit of a moment here. All right, uh, so enough from me. Uh, I am going to turn things over to Akram and uh, we're going to get this thing rolling. Akram, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Jim. And I really would like to thank uh, NYU at the Kevorkian Center for hosting this and for NYU Abu Dhabi. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And certainly it is a pleasure and privilege to be with David and Marina, whose work is exemplary in the field of digital humanities. I have, I'm setting my timer, so I will shut up at 11 minutes because I was told, yeah, I'm supposed to speak for 10, but I can kind of sneak in an extra minute. So here it goes. If you hear beeping, it's me telling myself to be quiet. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about my experience. Uh, I, I really am not going to try to attempt to sort of see the whole, you know, talk about the whole field because that would be highly presumptuous of me, but rather I'm gonna take a few experiences through the work that we've done here at the Khairala Center, uh, especially in the field of digital humanities, obviously, uh, and try to draw some lessons out of those. For me personally, I don't know if they will be meaningful. I hope they will be meaningful to uh, the audience and I hope that we will have a good conversation about them. Uh, but first, just a quick background. The Khairala Center was established about six years ago, and our mission is basically to preserve the memory and history of uh, Lebanese slash really Arab, we think of Lebanese in an imperial sense here, uh, Arab immigrants uh, in the United States, but also beyond the United States. And that project is very much uh, premised and based, founded on building of an archive. So that's really at the core of it. And from that archive, we tell stories. Uh, we tell stories in documentaries, in uh, virtual exhibits, uh, in digital humanities projects, you name it, we do it, you know, in sort of that sense. So I'm speaking from that kind of background and an effort to create a transnational archive. Because one of the first things I would like to sort of speak about here is that the very nature of the people we are right, you know, looking for to collect their memories are people who are, mobility is at the center of their lives. They live transnational lives, they are mobile, uh, you know, we might say they live in diasporas, although that's a fraught word, but they're constantly circulating. And so in many ways, the archive itself has to follow them. Uh, it cannot be a very state archive. It cannot be just a singular archive, sit, you know, sitting in a particular geographical space. So from the outset then, we were really thinking of an archive that is as much about lives of people who came here, but also of those who they left wherever they came from. Generally speaking, the folks we follow are from the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, uh, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Israel. And so the archive itself dictated that we think along those lines, that these geographic boundaries that normally we, we find sometimes within archives become rather meaningless because we're following these lives. Uh, but I would like to, beyond that kind of general introduction, I'd like to focus on uh, three things. First of all, uh, digital humanities projects, and I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, are incredibly expensive and time consuming. Uh, none of, I mean, I didn't sign up for that. Honestly, when I went to you know, Berkeley for my PhD, I thought I would just sit, you know, lead a quiet life in some sort of my own little archive and uh, live there. But digital humanities projects are incredibly expensive, yet I have to say they are very vital. Uh, they're vital at this particular moment because they're providing accessibility in ways that we did not have before. And I'll demonstrate that in my second point in a bit. Uh, they are vital because uh, they make, I think to a certain extent, especially if you're doing open source archives, which is what we're dedicated to do at the Khairala Center, uh, a more democratic notion of an archive. They're vital because they also have the potentiality, although we don't always practice it, of creating an archive that is not simply curated by those who are at the helm of the archive, but rather that is open source in the sense that you're allowing the community and beyond to help you cu curate it. Uh, I'm not talking on a completely egalitarian process because that would be a lie at this point, but we do at the Khairala Center are constantly inviting people to tell us what they would like to see. Uh, so social media, you know, our newsletter, but also the archive itself becomes a, a, a site for conversation. And I think that's very different from a traditional archive that I grew up with, where I never really had a conversation with the curator. I was just told what they had. Uh, and I was very lucky if they gave it to me, especially if I was somewhere in Cairo, uh, you know, Dar al or in Syria at the at Assad Library. So uh, I think there's really a powerful element of this. But the one of the things about it then, because it's so expensive, it becomes in, in many ways a Northern hemisphere shifting us to a, tilting us in that regard. And it creates two problems. 
One is that you have to constantly be in fundraising mode, and I am. People run away from me now whenever they see me because I'm always having my hand out and I say, can you please fund? Uh, and they literally run away. Uh, but there's something less humorous and more problematic about the fundraising is that the digital humanities are increasingly being funded by high-tech companies. And there's an ethical issue involved with taking money from Google, from AWS, from Amazon, uh, from Adobe. Uh, they obviously have the funds. They want to fund it. They're anxious for it. It's sexy. Our university administration is constantly pushing us to do it. But there's an issue of the ethics that's involved in it that troubles me quite often. Not least of which is you know, the politics of high-tech companies in today's moment and then taking money from them and using that to do something else. Uh, but the bigger issue is what happens in the Middle East, because this is about archive digital humanities from in and of the Middle East. And so one of the ways that we have been trying to do is collaboration. I'll give you a very quick example. After August 4th explosion in the port of Beirut, uh, we teamed up with a group of uh, students from Université Saint-Joseph in Beirut, uh, history students who are very anxious to create an archive of that moment. And so what we have been working with them, and then we've expanded this, is training them to create their own archive through all our history collection, through social media harvesting, uh, through, uh, you know, uh, as well collecting images and what have you. And so we have been working by helping to sort of provide funding for them, uh, resources that we have that we can channel there, but also a lot of training. So we've been able to do a lot of webinar training because we believe that in many ways, the archive has to be built collaboratively, not you know, only in the sense that I have to go to computer scientists, but also I have to go to people in the region itself and work with them and provide them with the resources and tools that they need in order for them to do their job because they are also building an archive that will be helpful to us and will provide for that. So I think that's one thing that we are learning how to do and it's an initiative that we're just taking. The second uh, collaborative notion is that you absolutely have to start working and I think Marina and David uh, do this beautifully, you have to start working with people outside our discipline, the Middle East studies discipline completely. I mean, I spend a lot more time these days with statisticians, with computer programmers, uh, scientists. Uh, thankfully, my undergraduate degree was in computer engineering. So I think I know a little bit what they're saying, uh, although they lose me very quickly, believe me. But I have to spend a lot of time almost, you know, I think we need a dating app for these things in which we kind of put in what we want and then they can, you know, and then you can swipe uh, which ones you want, but you, you kind of go to them and I've had to learn how to speak their language as much as they have to speak mine. And I'm gonna show you very quickly, because uh, I don't have a whole lot of time, the product of what we came up with at this point. Uh, let's see, I hope I'm doing this. And this is an Arabic OCR, optical character recognition that we have developed. Uh, I'm gonna do very quickly for, um, the collection of Arab American newspapers that we have been collecting from North and South America. We have about 250,000 images and we're aiming for about a million images. But the thing about this is it's completely searchable database in Arabic. So one of the problems we face is that how do you make, you know, you can collect images of text, but how do you make it accessible? And by the way, we're not the only ones doing this. There are a whole lot of groups around the world. David is involved in this as well, I know. But in essence, this becomes a way for us to allow researchers uh, to very quickly access material that I spent way too many weeks of my life trying to access. So you go to something like this and all of this is text, right? Uh, this is, you know, we are just getting ready to launch this publicly. This would not have been possible without fantastic and quite frankly, exploitable graduate students. I mean, uh, this is the, 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 you know, work with them. You know, we, we, we work diligently with them. And this doesn't only work for Arabic, it works for Farsi, for, for any kind of uh, alphabet, you can train it. And I can talk a little bit more about the details. But the point of what I'm trying to show here isn't like, you know, the gee whiz, although believe me, it's gee whiz. Uh, it's rather that this would not have happened without collaboration. And that is also demanding from us to start talking to IT folks all the time. I mean, this is about database management. This is about, you know, image capture, about OCR. And our next level is going to be handwritten recognition. And the question comes again to funding. You know, like right now, Amazon is suggesting that they would provide us with some funding for this. And I still have to ask myself the question, uh, do I take the money or do I not take the money? So that's another issue that is emerging. And finally, because I, I only have a minute and 54 seconds, uh, one of the challenges that we have, I, I've sort of been very conscious about from the very beginning 
is that the perennial problem of archives is that they are far too focused on those who have the time, resources, and tools to leave a written audio or visual record. Sometimes we capture people beyond that, but a lot of times they are privileging a particular group of people. So the question for me is the silence of the archive. And it really haunts me in many ways from the beginning. Uh, it's an issue that I, you know, how do we go beyond the male bourgeois, you know, uh, classes, uh, the heteronormative classes to sort of open an archive that really goes beyond that. And it's something that we have not, uh, I, I don't think I have found an answer for. I think about it regularly. Uh, as I said, it really kind of haunts me at times. Uh, but what we have done is because we think about this, for us, it's become a, almost uh, a quest. We are constantly seeking out. So when somebody comes to us with material, not only do we curate, like we do we have enough of this material and I think all archivists deal with this, uh, but we ask the question, does this fit into pushing the boundaries of what we know about this particular community? The community that I deal with a lot are is a community that wants to tell a triumphalist story, you know, of in many ways, a heteronormative middle-class, you know, Horatio Elger. We came, we worked, we succeeded, right? I mean, the good immigrant, especially nowadays in the in view of the anti-immigrant rhetoric we see. But they don't talk about the challenges, uh, the racialization within the community against others, uh, as well as their own racialization. They don't talk about, uh, you know, the heteronormativity and the sort of marginalization of queer members of the community. They don't talk about you know, violence, domestic violence, uh, or the violence of the of the movement itself. They don't talk about, you know, uh, oh, I'm told to shut up. So very quickly, oops, shut up. Uh, so they don't talk about all these things that are subaltern in many ways. And that's something that I don't have an answer for, but it's something that we're seeking. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akram, and for sticking the time. <laughs> um, so we're gonna turn now to Marina. Just sharing my screen. Um, thank you, Akram. I'm going to say everything that Akram said, but I'm going to say it in Judeo Arabic. So I um, run a database. Um, hang on a second so I can see my notes and my slides at the same time. I run a database of medieval documents from Egypt and from the wider Mediterranean world called the Princeton Geniza Project, um, PGP. I'll probably end up using the acronym a lot. Um, and the texts are mostly in Arabic and Judeo-Arabic and mostly from the 10th through 13th centuries. Um, at the PGP, we deal only with the documentary texts. We don't deal with the entire Cairo Geniza. So the entire Geniza is estimated to be 400,000 fragments. And within that, I would estimate about 10% are documentary texts. So hopefully we'll get to 40,000 someday. Right now we have 30,000 entries in the database of which 24,000 are confirmed documentary texts. So there are 6,000 that we still have to examine and figure out exactly what they are. Somebody has flagged them somewhere along the line as documentary, but that might mean that they contain like one marginal note. So that remains to be seen. Hey, um, Marina, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know that the transition window, um, it's just blocking a little bit of the view. Interesting, what transition window? Does that help? That's better. Yeah, we can oh, we can gotcha. see we can see we can see the full view now. I just wanted to let you know. And you can still see the full view now, yeah? Yes. Perfect. Okay, good. That's fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, so we deal mostly with transcriptions. Um, the documents themselves are not always easy to read. Um, and so that's a big part of the work is just kind of good old-fashioned philology, like trying to make sense of the texts. Um, the PGP has been around since 1986, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, so it really just rode the cusp of the um, personal computing revolution, and you know it used to exist like on a um, on a terminal, <laughs> and then it was CD-ROM, and uh, and then eventually it went to the internet. Um, I took over the directorship of the PGP uh, in 2015 when I came to Princeton, um, but it's also true that I couldn't have written my dissertation without the PGP. Um, and that's true of almost everybody who works on the documentary Geniza. Um, my second book, The Lost Archive, was different because there I was dealing with texts that, that hadn't been uh, entered into any database and in many cases not edited before. The um, manuscripts are now housed in 60 libraries around the world, having arrived at those libraries and the private collections that preceded them. 
between 1888 and 1910, but they all were, they all survived in Egypt. Okay, so that's the background to um, the issues that I wanna raise. Um, the first is the issue of from the Middle East. So this, there's an issue of cultural patrimony, which I'm gonna address obliquely in the form of equality of access, because that's where it intersects with the digital. Um, it's very important that cultural treasures be accessible and usable to people in the places that they come from, or rather in the places where they survived, in this case for nearly a thousand years, right? Which is not the same as the places that the manuscripts originally came from. Um, the manuscripts from the Geniza are all over the Islamic world. I just did, have given you a kind of smattering of the places from which I regularly see um, documents. So this is very much a global and globalized world. So what I've tried to do is to create conditions of equal access through digitization, um, through crowdsourcing, although the crowdsourcing platform um, that I use is not the PGP itself, it's rather the Zooniverse. It's a project called Scribes of the Cairo Geniza, which is lots of fun and you can go there and play with Geniza fragments to your heart's content. Um, and then also making resources available for learning Judeo-Arabic, which if you know Arabic is actually ridiculously easy to do. Like all you have to learn is he learn the Hebrew alphabet, 22 characters, learn the conversions and you're done pretty much. Um, so the question is, is that enough? Am I doing enough? So I basically don't feel that I'm doing enough, but I also feel hamstrung um, as a pre-modernist, as a humanist and as an academic, three weak entry points to influencing power structures out there in the wider world. So another way to frame the same thought is that digitization is not a magic solution. In the end, um, it's all still about people and institutional power. Um, so to illustrate this, I'll just say that this is a brief anecdote. Four years ago, I gave a workshop at AUC, American University of Cairo. Um, and I wish I could tell you that I felt uncomfortable talking about the Cairo Geniza in Cairo, but I didn't. I could not have been happier. It felt like a homecoming. Uh, the hospitality was of course impeccable. Um, and when it comes to colonialism and the looting of Egypt's cultural patrimony and national resources, the Cairo Geniza is a sideshow. It's really the last thing on anybody's mind. Um, but there was one thing that freaked me out, and that is how could I justify what I was doing to the president and vice president of the Jewish community of Cairo, Magda Harun and Sami Ibrahim. So it turns out that I didn't have to because Sami did it for me. At the end of one of my um, seminars, he raises his hand and he says with a candor that I subsequently had a chance to appreciate more deeply, Princeton University doesn't own a single Geniza fragment. That's true, we just deal with digital surrogates but they've been building digital tools for Geniza research for the last 35 years. What's our excuse, said he. Um, so I'm not saying that it's that simple, but I do feel that digital restitution is something within the capacity of academics and humanists and even of pre-modernists um, and that we need to do, to do more of it. Um, okay, so that's my first point. My second point is I've invested an increasing proportion of my time in digital projects. This is exactly what Akram said. This like, I didn't sign up for this. It's great, but I didn't sign up for it. Um, I'm approaching the end of a year long sabbatical during which I've done nothing else besides, well, you know, survive the pandemic and make sure that my family survives and work on digital projects. So um, I'm not really gonna get into the details. I'm rebuilding the Princeton Geniza project database with a fantastic team from the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton. And it's just been an education on all fronts and we love each other and it's great. What matters is that the more time I spend on digital work, the more I feel like, first of all, like a normal professional rather than an academic, like I you know, have meetings all the time. Um, in fact, I spend my days in meetings. This is my team. This is a meeting that I was in literally right before I got online um, to talk to you guys. Um, this is what I do all day. Um, and that means that most of my work is now collaborative. So this initially caused me some consternation because of my academic socialization and probably yours as well which has taught us that a sabbatical in which you haven't made progress on your next book is basically a wasted sabbatical. So the closer I've gotten to the end of my sabbatical, but like nowhere near closer to the end of, of or even the middle of the book that I wanted to be writing, the more I've started to think that what I'm doing in building digital humanities tools might be actually more valuable than writing books, not just because it's important for me to believe in what I'm doing, makes me feel better about myself, but also because it's allowed me to think critically about academic socialization and the disproportionate privilege assigned to faculty who publish, as opposed to the dozens of people who make our jobs possible, including people with PhDs who happen to work nine to five jobs in libraries and university presses and so forth. So like, why should I write another book that maybe if I'm lucky a hundred people will read when I can help 
a hundred up and coming researchers write their next book, which will also get them a job and tenure. So of course I'm not alone. Plenty of faculty work with developers and other computational specialists whose expertise lies in domains far from our own as well we should. If we want digital tools that work, we have to help build them. We have to be inside the teams that do that. We have to be involved in researching how to build them best practices, conceiving of what a database can do, data cleaning, priorities and desiderata and digital tools. In other words, technology doesn't happen on its own. And developers can't make good technology without good data. And you can't have good data without the domain experts. So what would the humanities look like, I have been asking myself, if we invested less in the single author publication as a measure of worth and more in collaborative projects that help other researchers, um, whether uh, print or digital projects. So that leads me to my last point. Um, the manuscripts that I work with can be very difficult um, to read. Uh, and um, increasingly, I read them with others. Zoom has facilitated collaborative paleography sessions, not just because we can annotate right on the screen, which really keeps you honest as a paleographer. It's like, show me, why do you read that letter there? But also because now that I'm constantly collaborating, I see very clearly that single authorship is an inefficient way to work. So the question is how long will it be before tenure and, pro tenure and promotion standards in the humanities um, catch up with the collaborative methods that the digital age encourages? Um, and how long before classrooms catch up with the fact that our students are gonna be collaborating on projects in life much more than they're gonna be working alone. So why not teach them how to collaborate rather than narcissistically trying to reproduce in the classroom what our own academic socialization has taught us? Um, you know, this is like shocking to hear myself say this because on the one hand, I'm the one who's always like, these kids have to learn to construct a proper sentence, um, paragraph argument. Um, but I want my undergraduates also to learn to model productive and process oriented collaboration in the classroom, even in their final projects. And I want my grad students to have to work on collaborative projects, whether mine or somebody else's and design projects in collaboration with other people. So that's what I'm thinking about. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Marina. That was brilliant and gives us, I think, uh, I think it's received so warmly uh, and I, I think gives us a lot to, to think about as we move on in our conversation. David, I'm gonna turn things uh, over to you uh, for your 10 minutes. Thanks so much. Um, I wanna just thank the team, first of all, like our, my uh, co-panelists have for the warm welcome to participate in this event today. It's really uh, great to be in this uh, group. And I also want to thank Marina and Akram for such thoughtful uh, comments that put that really set up some of the things that I want to say today. Um, so first of all, Ramadan Karim uh, to everybody who's on the call and Sam Makbul for those of you who are fasting. I know that's actually not an easy thing to do while you're working. Um, my, the title of today's uh, panel is Future um, Digital Research on in from the Middle East. And those kind of slashes are kind of typical for me of sort of area studies contradictions, right? Where we try to think about like, are we in, are we of, are we there, are we here? And the thing that's interesting to me is how the preposition with is missing. So um, with the idea of with, um, which actually, by the way, has been brought up both by Akram and Marina, um, not uh, specifically talking about the preposition, but the idea of a collaborative with the Middle East. I'd like to talk about just a little bit about the things that I've been doing um, for the last 20 years um, in my the various academic positions that I've been holding. So before I go there, though, the, the, I'd just like to say that the idea of with is interesting because it, it brings up the transnational that um, Akram brought up, the transnational in the archive. But we also have a, a transnationality of actors, right, and of digital actors. And I would be one of those, right? I'm a just to be position, just to tell you about my own positionality, right? I have been teaching in the Middle East since 2002, was at the American University of Beirut and now at NYU Abu Dhabi. I'm an American, I'm a white American, right? And I have been, but I have this, I've had positions that have allowed me to move. And I think that one of the interesting things about the, even the series, the Digital Fourier series is the, the extent to which actors who have that kind of capacity to move are the ones that tend to make it onto Western screens, right? And so we have them as part of our conversations. There are, however, a lot of other people living in the Middle East who do not have that possibility. Um, and I would just like to say, before I get going, that for one of the things for me about digital, I am a associate professor of digital humanities. Um, and I, so I'm coming from an academic uh, research perspective. 
Um, but digital research um, with the Middle East or digital research from the Middle East, interestingly, will not always be about the Middle East, right? And I think this is like an important, just an important thing to push forward um, uh, in thinking about my, my conversation. Now, some of the things I'm gonna be talking about have to do with the region because there is, of course, always that kind of expectation of people working in the region, doing things of the region, right? Speaking to people outside the region about those. Um, but we also, I think that, that there's a larger ecosystem of the digital um, that's actually emerging in a place like the Middle East that's worth thinking about and the, 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 the interactions between academic research projects and that a set of expectations is um, actually, uh, I think, a very fruitful place um, to, 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 to discuss from. So um, I just gave a talk recently called Data and Infrastructure as Privilege, um, in which I was in, in actually talking about, um, thinking about um, how uh, digital, the digital moment, and I say the digital moment, there are, of course, many digital moments, but I mean the digital moment that everyone is talking about, which seems to be co uh, coincide with uh, pandemic and Zoom, that, that digital moment seems like there's a is, a is a particularly ripe moment in which we can um, democratize access to different kinds of um, talk to different kinds of academic knowledge, right? So it's it works very nicely with the decolonizing the curriculum conversation, right? Um, on the other hand, um, I think that one of the things that's fascinating, even though we have lots of democratized data creation and we have lots of access to new kinds of, 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 of information um, and, um, and a particularly of academic information, the new side of privilege for me is actually an infrastructural ability. So um, I have a, also another paper that I've written that speaks specifically about this and I coin a term called, I say, infra infrastructural difference. And so when we look though, so in other words, to these places that we might actually be collaborating with, we often don't assume that they're in the same, we assume that they're in the same place as we are. They assume that we're in the same sets of conversations that we are and or, and or we push them into those, right? And so there's this way in which infrastructure is, I apologize, we have a dog who knows that I'm on camera now. And so is of course talking to me. Um, but the, um, so in other words, the, uh, the infrastructure can be both a con an opening and something that gives us access to new ways of being and, and creating knowledge in the world, but it also be a, constrict a constricting thing, right? It can actually like close us into what are dominant models. Um, and so, a question that I just like to ask the, the group here is that if, if we think about this idea of centering new voices um, in, the, in the academic um, commons, what does it actually mean to center new infrastructural abilities or center new infrastructures or, or ways of dealing with information also in that academic commons? So with that in mind, three things I'd like to just bring it up with the chart, the things that we've been doing at NYU Abu Dhabi. First one uh, is in collaboration actually with multiple global actors and that's called Right to Left. And so I have a, this is our third year, we're having a conference just simply called RTL or Right to Left that's taking place at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute in Victoria in British Columbia. And our idea there comes from a paper that's going to appear next year in Debates in Digital Humanities. And that's me, um, uh, Nathan Gibson and Kasra Gorbaninajad. Uh, and the idea there is that thinking about um, digital humanities in an environment like the Middle East or on an environment like the Middle East really has to include actors coming from those places. Because if the digital is a habitus, it's a space in which everyone is actually living and working, languages that people are using, and I mean here both um, ancient and living languages, because I think there is a continuum between the two, places where these, these languages are being read and, and spoken and, and, and worked with, that if we're not actually including those people in our conversations about a future of a computing that can deal with different scripts and can deal with it, where things are actually implemented, not just where there are standards, but where things are implemented for accessibility, if we don't include those people, we're leaving out a large part of the equation. So that conference has actually been really interesting because it started to bring in people who work on Pashto and people who work on Urdu and people who work on Hebrew and people who work on, on Ladino and all kinds of versions of the, the, the right to left uh, languages and in computing environments. The second thing that I'd like to talk about is more of an on the ground position or an on the ground um, kind of 
working in the in the local environment. And that's our Winter Institute in Digital Humanities that I've worked on with Beth Russell that we've done. Uh, we did one uh, that was actually uh, in person in 2020, just before things uh, exploded. And then we've done one that's now virtual. And we went from 100 people to 300 people attending that. And what's interesting is, of course, this is a, an opportunity for scholarly exchange, for scholarly engagement, for learning new methods, for doing that kind of thing that takes so much work, right? It's a, it's a really, uh, it's a lot of work. And that's not to, to, to echo something that Marina has said, that's not traditionally something that an, a professor in an arts and humanities division would have been doing, right? Um, so, but I think that one is really important. That one's been supported by the NYU Abu Dhabi Library, as well as the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. And it's really important about creating those ecosystems on the ground so that people know when they want to engage with the digital and they want to infuse their academic work or their community work with the digital, what are possibilities as opposed to fantasies? And the third thing that I want to talk about is a project that we've been running now for several years. And this is with my colleague, Nora Barakat, who is now at Stanford, but we created at NYU And this is called our Open Gulf um, Research Group. And Open Gulf is a transdisciplinary research group that began with certain kinds of things in mind, thinking about corpora, thinking about mapping, um, and particularly thinking about taking a text such as Lorimer's Gazetteer about the um, Arabia, the general area of the Arabian Peninsula, spatializing and thinking about that as a way of deconstructing colonial knowledge production about the region. So it started in that kind of decolonizing mode. But what's happened then is it's actually un it's allowed us to kind of unearth a whole set of questions about what is the Middle East and how many layers of things are there actually in the Middle East. And what do we, how can we use digital environments to tap into that? So this has meant looking for archives, looking for different kinds of materials. And what we see is the texture of the digital is so complex because archival materials about the same place in different languages are just not accessible in the same kinds of ways, right? And so we're really having to kind of think about how about representation, about different, what are the voices that are there, about the ways that we contrast those voices and so, and the last thing that I would say about that though, and that kind of connects all three of these pieces, the right to left, the Winter Institute in Digital Humanities and Open Golf, is that the more that you think about expanding digital research into new fields and into new languages, the more complicated the workflows, right? That one had that were actually pretty easy in some ways, not easy, but that were doable. There were, there were pathways for that um, in Western languages or in ancient Western languages in particular. When you move into other languages, what you end up is in all these worlds, all these spaces where there are these interesting data gaps and workflow gaps and infrastructure gaps. And it just becomes like such a complicated and, and overwhelming sometimes, um, uh, you know, kind of morass of, 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 of complexity. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, but what I would like to say is that when we're thinking about digital research in the Middle East, that we think about working with the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Uh, brilliant. And I'm now going to turn things over to Jared McCormick, who is going to offer some questions and some further provocations for discussion between our panelists for about 20 minutes. I just want to remind everyone, uh, please don't be shy about posting a, a comment or a question in the chat. We will curate those and get to them in about 20 minutes uh, with our panelists. Uh, or if you just want to uh, keep your question until uh, that point, you can raise your hand in, in about 20 minutes or so. We'll, we'll let you ask your question. Okay, Jared, please take it away. Hi. Um, thank you, everybody. I just want to echo what, what David said. Um, you know, and I don't mean this like the cake frosting, like, oh, you guys did so good, but they were so much such thoughtful responses there. And so this is quite a difficult task. Um, I think um, the, the first thing I might just kind of start with as a, as a thread to really turn it back over to you guys. Um, so I appreciate David's um, addition of another preposition, which is, is very helpful to think, you know, one small uh, shift of the lens and it actually renders it, it very differently. But it also is, you know, this uh, frenetic, uh, position where we're in an area studies of all of these lines of how do you connect it's from here, it's of there. And um, 
I think the, the, the digital work doesn't supersede that, but it very much uh, comes from that and it, it, it embodies it. And so I just wanted to start maybe with this question of, of the David really kind of um, framed of, of infrastructures, but it's also um, was in each of your um, entry points here. And so, you know, we were offered kind of uh, thinking about collaboration um, I loved this, um, Marina, you said we didn't sign up for it and you kind of picked up on something that, that Akram said, you know, and it, and it made me think about, well, what about the people now who actually do want to sign up for it? Or the people that are trying to sign up for it and they feel like they're the fish swimming upstream in the class, in the department, in the university, right? On all of these different levels, um, itself. But, um, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to kind of maybe turn this back to you guys, because I think what what I would love to kind of maybe ask in, um, is from all of the projects that you guys are working on, if you might have something to add to this idea of infrastructure, because we're talking on so many different registers and scales, specifically from, you know, upper administration in the university to a department itself, to the choices that you're making and how you're teaching um, project-based learning in the classroom itself. Um, and so I thought it might be interesting for the audience, for everyone, um, if you might kind of open that up or give an example of how you've worked through it or kind of building infrastructures or where you hit a dead end in a specific way that might kind of illustrate um, how things should change or what needs to be addressed. Shall we go in the same order that we spoke, or how would you like to do it? Yeah, it's a free for all. Oh, it's, I'm gonna, all I'm right. gonna, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm adding everybody in here to the table, to the digital oh. table. Look, this is and... like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I always like these little, you know, Hollywood Square effect. Uh, my colleagues, I, you know, for the audience before we uh, started, I offered my colleagues the opportunity to go ahead of me, and they completely turned me down. You know, they didn't want to go ahead of me. So I'm, I'll start with this a little bit. Uh, I think the minute you say digital humanities in universities, there is quote unquote sexiness to it that they immediately kind of say, sure, that sounds great. But I think they understand digital humanities quite often, at least I should say within my university as something that could be monetized. And I mean that in both ways, both as getting money into the university. And here again, we go back to the high tech companies that are funding a lot of these things like Google and Amazon, but two, monetize as technology transfer, right? I mean, like one of the first conversation I had about Arabic OCR when, you know, we're collecting these newspapers and my question is, well, how do people search these newspapers? Uh, commercial OCR doesn't seem to do it very well, you know, for archival material. So I started exploring this possibility. One of the first questions I was asked when I was asking for some funding, internal funding was, can this be monetized? Uh, so, and my answer is, no, I'm not interested in monetizing this. Uh, this is supposed to be an open source project for everybody. That's the whole point of it. And then, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in funding. You have to go get something else. Uh, so I think there is this challenge that you have. So that's one level. The second for me, again, and I'm just speaking from personal experience here, is that uh, creating a coherent group, working group requires grants. In other words, you cannot expect masters and PhD students to be involved in this without saying that you're gonna get grants that is gonna fund them so they can work on this and it becomes their dissertation. And that is in itself a huge undertaking. This is to echo what Marina and David said is we spend a lot of times doing this. And a lot of this is hidden labor. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not apparent because at the end of the year when you do your annual report, you don't say, well, okay, I you know, I spent you know, 60 hours trying to write a grant that I didn't get or what have you, I mean, that kind of stuff, because a lot of, you're not gonna get every grant you write, we all know that. So a lot of the labor is gonna be lost, so to speak, and you can't, you know, turn it into a little tick box that says, oh, I did well this year. So, I mean, I think there is, there's an investment that you have to make that translates, you have to be in a secure place within the university to make that investment. In other words, I don't care if my annual report says you're not going to get a raise or you're going to get a raise because honestly they don't give us raises but i have tenure i'm done so there's a security there that is not available to professional track faculty and to you, you know uh, uh assistant level 
non-tenure yet faculty. So there's a danger for them to invest in these things, even though, as uh, you were saying, some want to be involved in that. So I think you have to create an infrastructure that protects them and then invites them in. And that's a challenge for us as well, especially as established scholars. And the last thing is, you know, that I would say is that for me, I have had to learn that because I'm a historian by training, uh, where I was trained to speak to my fellow historians. That is how my training went. I have to prove myself to my fellow historians. You know, that's the peer review process, that's the publication process that Marino was talking about. And in fact, I have to re-educate myself, sometimes painfully, because it's hard to kind of break these habits, to think that I actually have to be a public historian. And I mean that in two ways. One, a public historian is in the sense that I am engaging the community in the production of knowledge as well as in the consumption of knowledge. I mean, I think that becomes a very important thing. It's a conversation that I think David is sort of planting widely by saying with the Middle East. And that's something that I'm very, uh, I think there's an arrogance that I came to this project with, I have to be very honest, because we're trained to be egotistical and sure of ourselves. You know, other, you know, we have theses and we challenge existing frameworks, which is fine and well, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it doesn't lend itself well to be, to, to playing to playing nicely <laughs> with non-scholars, and I had to learn how to play nicely. But the second part of how to be, you know, public historian uh, is to learn new tools, and I think the digital humanities is part of that. But it's also learning tools and allowing, attracting new types of students that Marina talked about, which is students that are interested in collaborative work. But that's a very fraught process as well because you're telling them this is really the way to go, but I am not sure departments are ready for this way to go. So I always lose, I literally lose sleep sometimes with my PhD students thinking, am I guiding them the wrong way? Are they gonna get jobs? I mean, are they playing by, because the rules are lagging. And this, you know, Marina mentioned this in an email that we exchanged. Our department is still trying to come to terms with, you know, if I do a digital mapping, you know, like I've done a digital mapping uh, project, does that count as an article? It's not peer review, but does it count as an article? It's a lot of work. So, I mean, that infrastructure is, is very organic. It's a, it's a work in progress and it's, it's fraught every step of the way for me anyway. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things I think about all the time is um, how in Europe, there is a laboratory model for humanities research that we lack here. And that means that they've had to come to terms with the fact that humanities research is collaborative just like it is in the sciences. And they've also had to come up with metrics to evaluate collaborative research and quantify it. And as much as people in Europe complain all the time about having to quantify everything and you know, prove themselves to the you know, commission of this and that, the fact is that they are rewarded for labor that for us is hidden labor. Um, I mean, I'm not complaining because actually in terms of working conditions in many ways we have it better than they do, but that's one place where they're way ahead of us. Um, can you sign up for collaborative research? It's tough. Um, and I think we have to find ways of kind of finessing this for now um, until the upper administrations catch up to this reality. Um, you know, one of the advantages that they have in Europe is that, um, is that PhD, you can hire a PhD student to write a dissertation on a particular topic. And that is something that won't happen here and shouldn't happen here because for us, part of the way you prove yourself as a PhD student is to design your own research topic, right? Design your, your own research project. Um, so I think one way to do that is, I mean, in a way, like I'm fortunate because I work with, like the Guinea is such a specialized field that people come to work with me on the Geniza or at least on languages that the Geniza uses like other stuff in Judeo-Arabic or um, other stuff to do with Arabic manuscripts. And that means that I can say, hey, do you want a part in the Prince and Geniza project team? Um, and, and if they don't, if there's some other team they wanna work with, that's great, I'll make it happen, I'll make the phone calls. Um, and that's, that's happening in the case of one of my students who's working on documents in Sicily, which is not something that I work with, but luckily there's a team um, in the UK that is. Um, and then to have that collaborative research be part of the infrastructure of your 
of your dissertation, right? So that's that's one way of finessing it. Um, I was uh, fortunate to get, I mean, for me, what changed my life was in 2014, I got a collaborative grant from the NEH and I started working in a team for the first time and I kind of saw how amazing it was. Um, but these, basically these were PhD students of mine who had families and couldn't move and had finished. And um, they weren't gonna move for a one year postdoc. So I kind of created this remote um, team and, um, and, and I just figured out like, okay, well, one of them is working on this topic, one is working on this topic and I'm working on this topic. Where's the intersection of that? Okay, I'm gonna write a grant application on that. Um, so that, you know, there are gonna be ways of finessing this. Um, infrastructure is, is an interesting question because, so I, Princeton is a ridiculously well-resourced institution as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and yet not everything is possible with money. Right, because there there also needs to be infrastructure in the institutional sense. Um, so one of the things that has that was really frustrating to me, um, basically until last summer when I started working closely with the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton, is that there's a very fragmented and inaccessible digital landscape across the university. You have, um, you know, OIT, like the people who actually like make the place run. Um, you have um, instructional technology, and in fact, the PGP was entirely built by instructional technologists, um, and it was kind of, you know, basically slapped together and continued to be slapped together insofar as it related to actual teaching, and that was one of the things I was trying to move away from because it's basically, it's huge, and it's not fair to the instructional technologists to saddle them with something like this. Then you have the computer scientists. So there are the research scientists and then there are the engineers who are considered by the computer scientists to be like transactional. Like they're not doing research, they're just like, you know, building stuff, um, which is different. So this, and then there's the fact that, that the whole computing landscape just moves so much more quickly than we're accustomed to as humanists. So like, you know, I mean, computer vision, for example, is like completely central to everything that computer scientists are doing right now, that and machine learning in a way that they weren't, you know, like six years ago, right? I mean, that's for us, that's like a nanosecond because we deal with like, you know, <laughs> glacial, um, glacial processes. I was surprised. The CDH didn't just solve a problem of infrastructure for me in terms of like, now I have developers that I can work with. Um, it solved a much bigger, issue, which is because they're digital humanists, they're not just like, here, we want to throw some developers at your project. They're like, no, we're going to help you build a team. You need a project manager. We're going to train your project managers. Um, we are going to show you how to run an effective meeting. I can't tell you how much I learned about that. It was unbelievable. Don't tell my department or they're going to try to make me chair. Um, and, um, you know, everything from like icebreaker questions, you know, really nitty gritty stuff to keeping an agenda, how do you record, stuff like that. Um, it's all about the people, it's all about the team, and it's all, all about building trust in your team. Otherwise, none of this is, is gonna happen effectively. Yeah, so I, the thing, when I talk about infrastructure, um, for me, infrastructure, has, it's obviously a technical thing, like it's the way that things move or maybe the setup for your, um, for your data, your project, but infrastructure is also a human, aspect. I mean, I really do believe that it's sort of like saying capacity building is another term, the kind of buzzword that one finds and sometimes in, uh, in grant, uh, grant schemes. So it's that balancing of the, the human and the tech um, that is, for me, is, I guess, what's going to keep things moving, I hope. Um, but I think these are things that are just missing in so many, so many places, right? That both parts are missing. And it's not even that necessarily that the humans in an organization, I think as Marina was as getting at, even know how it go, they go about building the tech, right? So there's kind of a compounded problem. So I guess to your question, Jared, about building infrastructure. So let's take one example. So the Winter Institute for in Digital Humanities. So in that case, um, I am a professor at NYU Abu Dhabi, and so we belong to the global network at NYU, have an extraordinary amount of digital infrastructure that we can tap into. And if I were to teach then at such an event, conduct training activities at such an event, um, courses where they were only being taught to learn inside of that privileged infrastructure of NYU, it would be 
selling a false bill of goods, right? It would be saying, you can't now take this home. So in such an environment, like even in my teaching, there's a kind of a tension between the open and that which facilitates, right? The infrastructure is something which helps us get really far. And so in my undergraduate courses, I can go really far because I have certain licenses. Whereas in other uh, interactions as with the larger community, I can't do that. And I really think that there's an ethics to um, meeting communities where they are and meeting the communities with what they can actually do. And that doesn't just mean creating data that then fuels back into the infrastructures of the global north, but perhaps even showing them ways that they can do it themselves. And I think that Akram's example of that um, with the, 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 the group of researchers in Beirut is a great example of that. I guess for me, I also agree that infrastructure is a modeling process. We model infrastructure for people around us. And what I, when I say that, I mean by doing something and by exposing the way that it's done, we allow others to imitate us and we allow others to, 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 to work with us and to think about ways that they can do things themselves. So for me, again, it's, it's sort of like, it is of course engaging with other people in the production of knowledge, but it is creating the possibility by example, that this can actually be done. And I think one of the key, so I'm involved in a set of conversations about thinking about what it might look like if we had a graduate program in our division um, at NYU Abu Dhabi and the Arts and Humanities Division. And there we're having a conversation about alternative products uh, or alternative results or deliverables, or <laughs> these are all terrible terms in the humanities, right? But alternative um, endpoints or pathways, right? To, to, to getting a degree. And what's really come up with us in that conversation is the extent to which we have an imported model and that imported model of a thesis, which is a proto book, which is a this, which is a that, of a career path, is that actually like benefiting the, the people that we bring to our school and that are in other places? Should they be reproducing that particular model? So to take Marina's idea of, 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 all, of alternative endpoints, right, um, for humanistic scholarship, I think we can also think about that as again, having an ethical uh, element to it. Do we want to impose old methods that don't even work stateside, right? Or in Europe, do you want to impose those then upon other parts of the world? That's a, it's, it's, a, it's something that's worth debating. And I guess lastly, I would say that on the long, the, the science of infrastructure as containing an ethical or having an ethical dimension, I have this piece called Enacting Open Scholarship in Transnational Contexts, in which I talk about the collaboration, the transnational collaboration between people, and in, in particular in what I would call sort of open digital scholarship, um, is that, if, that there's, if there's a principle of kind of leaving the people that you collaborate with more empowered than when you started collaborating with them. It's an extraordinarily important piece, right? Is, reaching out to people in a part of the world because they have language skills or because they have, I don't know, access to things on the ground or because that's fine. But then part of digital scholarship for me is that you then train people in a way which empowers them and which leaves them to do, to reproduce these things. So it's a bit like the modeling question again. So I just would, infrastructure also has ethics. Thank you. Yeah, and I think everything you just said really connects back with your entry point of this preposition of with, right? Almost all of those points really were kind of further like strengthening what the, because I was going to ask a question kind of, you know, not to let that float by us. Um, and I mean, maybe just Akram, Marina, if, if either of you, if, if something came to mind with the with the with addition or in relation to your work. I, mean, I first of all, I completely agree with David. I mean, and this is the whole point. The premise of collaborating with people in the Middle East is it's not exploiting them. I mean, it's not a colonial model that we are implementing in which the global north is simply exploiting and uh, expropriating the know-how and the material of the global south. Uh, that is a model that we definitely should not replicate in our academic scholarly and you know work by all means. So again, the example that I give, uh, so I working with another organization to start digitizing genealogical records in the Middle East. Uh, because, you know, that becomes part of the historical trend. But one of the things that I insisted upon is, you know, A, that the people have to be trained uh, there. Uh, they have to be paid fair wages. 
uh, and what I, I mean by fair wage is the same wages you pay in the United States, you pay them there. This whole nonsense about, you know, they can buy more with a dollar. Uh, I insisted that uh, there will be a long-term process engagement with them. In other words, you don't use them and discard them. And finally, I insisted that there has to be a veto power about the material that is being digitized. Uh, and I'm not speaking in any specifics because we're still signing the contract at this point. So I don't want to be, you know, in case lawyers start getting upset with me. But I think for me, that is an important aspect of things. Same thing with the group that I'm working with out of Université Saint Joseph, these young undergraduates, so one of them is graduating. It is also not simply saying, okay, look, we can uh, provide you with training, which we did. We can provide you with some funding, which we did. For me, it's also saying, what path do you take in life? How can I help you with that path? So one of them is coming to become a graduate student here because she wants to pursue that. Uh, so, I mean, I think there, there becomes a huge responsibility for us to work in that kind of collaborative sense, though we owe it to them, not only to just simply, you know, use them, so to speak. And I don't think anybody here is saying we would, of course, but I'm, I'm speaking personally, but rather than to see that it becomes our duty and responsibility to open paths for them and to learn from them as much as they're learning from us, to listen to their concerns and their issues that they're going to bring up. And so I think that, and it's a learning process. Listen, I don't, I don't claim to have figured it out, but it's a learning process with me. And I, but it's something that I'm very, very conscious about because of the nature of the archive I work with, of course. So for me, one of the most effective examples of this that I have had the chance to work with personally is the International Society of Arabic Pap Papyrology, which probably you didn't know existed. Um, so it's an organization that's been around for uh, almost, no, 15, I bet, about 15 years, founded by Petra Seibestein, who's now in Leiden. At the time, she was a graduate student at Princeton. And um, ISAP is very, very intentional about um, partnering with um, students and faculty in Egypt um, and also bringing the um, every you know three or four years as a conference bringing the conference to Egypt every other time it meets um, and then the other times it's in Europe um, and making it possible for especially students from Egypt um, to come to ISAP when it's in Europe um, but you know, now that I'm on the board of ISAP and I see the meetings, I see how much um, thought and um, labor has to go into this. Otherwise, it's not just going to happen magically um, by itself. And of course, one of the pleasures of this was seeing um, a few graduate students from Egypt, um, some even, you know, started hanging out in ISAP when they were undergrads, come up through the ranks as Coptic or Arabic pepperologists do like a postdoc in Europe and then go back to Egypt and get a tenure track position. So it's it it takes thought, but you know it ha it absolutely has to happen. And and ISAP would be I think a bankrupt organization, you know, intellectually without that. Um, I think a lot about like you know I mean as I was saying in in my remarks before like what more can I do. Um, and, and I'm sure there are lots of ideas that people here will come up with and, and throw at us. But one of the things I think about is like, you know, can like, so the Princeton University Library has a, 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 a fellowship. Like you come to Princeton for a week, a month, I can't remember what it is, but it's some like short amount of time and you work in special collections or stuff that you can only work on in Princeton. Um, I want people coming from the Middle East to Princeton to do that. Is this gonna be possible? Right. So, you know, first of all, the funding. OK, so, you know, you can't just pay them a stipend. Like if you're on, I don't know, like an Iraqi wage, like, you know, you also need to have room and board paid for you. Um, otherwise, this is just like not going to be possible. Um, that's one thing, too, is there's the issue of visas. Right. So we need to think seriously also about what we can do in terms of supporting um, scholarly work in the region without requiring travel. That's like another, I think, piece of this. Thanks. So I just want to remind um, everybody, we're kind of, we have a, a, just short of, of half an hour here. If you do have a question, please type it in the chat or raise your hand. We would love to hear from all of you. While that, oh, Anne, you've, okay. I'm gonna, I have, I have a question on the back burner, but, um, 
if we can get Anne um, unable, able to unmute herself, let's go to you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so uh, let me just say just very briefly by way of introduction, I'm Anne Morning and I'm the academic director at 19 Washington Square North, which is NYU Abu Dhabi's home in, in New York. Uh, so I'm just really pleased that we had the opportunity to co-sponsor this terrific event. And I really want to thank Jared and Jim for, for bringing this, this together. Um, but aside from that, the, the other reason uh, that I'm here, my question is really motivated actually by my, my other portfolio, which is that I'm a sociologist of race and ethnicity. And as you can imagine, my ears really have pricked up when I've heard you all talk in different ways about issues of inclusion. Um, and, and particularly when my old friend Akram, who we're, we're reunited now after many years of service together on the US Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic and Other Populations. So it's, it's very nice to have this, this connection. Um, but Akram mentioned racialization. He mentioned sort of different communities that may or may not be included. And it, as I'm understanding it, a lot of your conversation so far has been about inclu inclusion as it extends to who gets to produce these archives, participate in it, um, you know, who will have access to it, which are all really important questions. But I also have a question about inclusion when it comes to the content of these archives. That is, I'm curious to know whether in your experience you see a lot of what we sociologists would call boundary work, that is a lot of emphasis to sort of drawing the lines around what is properly included and what doesn't really fit. Um, what kinds of communities, materials, or ephemera should be preserved in this way, which community should not be included. Um, and I'm really, you know, I'm curious because my, my naive point of view as a person who, who doesn't have expertise in digital archives, my naive presumption is to think, well, it's digital, you can just include everything. Why not? Just, you know, you, you wouldn't have to engage in much boundary drawing. But again, that's a completely naive perspective. So I'm very curious to know whether in your experience you find that even with the flexibilities that dig digital archives afford you, if you still see kind of battles around what is the proper content, content and who should properly be uh, represented or included in their materials. And thank you all for these wonderful, wonderful and really thoughtful comments. Should, should we do a reverse order where David goes first and then? You know what, Akram, let's do it. Just right. because you said so. All right. Yeah. Beginning with W for the first time in my life, I'll go first, right? Except for that kindergarten teacher who I think was also a Z or something and would put me first just for fun. So, um, Anne, thank you for that great question. Really super. So let me give you an example of something that's happened recently that might sort of shed some light on what you're talking about. So during the pandemic, everything sort of switched. We all started relying upon digital resources a whole lot more, not having the same kinds of access to spaces or to books or to different forms of information. And one of the things that got really like the, the light, like showed, I had really, really strong on something in my field. So if we're gonna, let's say I'm teaching a class on, on, on computational textual analysis. And what I wanna do is in the pandemic, turn to places where I can find text. Well, first of all, NYU Abu Dhabi, we work in English. So we're, that's the lingua franca. So we're using English, but then what ends up happening is, is if we turn to, okay, what's available in English? What you find is that the digital or rather the digitized has a history to it, right? And so definitely the digitized does not center the voices that all the comp all the, the 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 myriad of voices that we could imagine in the world, and it certainly has not in the past, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, digitized materials have not necessarily um, you know included all of those uh, all of those different um, all all that and what you're talking about the boundary work. So we end up with a lot of neo colonial stuff that sits from it's actually the same books that probably were created by empire that would have sat in all the libraries of the world right those are the things which were which had been digitized so there's definitely work to be done to bring forward to center new voices in the digital world but that takes a lot of time you know it takes a lot of time and there's been really interesting work that's been done about how there were actually early attempts at doing that but even dominant kind of uh, dominant voices in society didn't actually raise those up and so there's been important work done on, on sort of going back and looking at 
archive rot, you know, like where you had, okay, let's do boundary work in the 1990s. Well, where did it go? Well, it was sitting on a website, but you know what? That website wasn't maintained. So there's like, there's so many levels of, um, of where we bring what we would call inclusion in academic informational terms to where we would, how we match that to technical uh, inclusion terms and sort of the, the histories of technology. So thanks for that great question. Yeah, really, really interesting question. And um, so people who work on the documentary guineas are social historians. So we kind of take it for granted. Like what we care about most is, um, is the excluded. Um, you know, there have been amazing, amazing um, research projects that are turning or have, or have been turned into books um, on women, on, um, enslaved people on uh, the rural, on the poor. I mean, this is kind of like the bread and butter of, of the documentary Geniza. But, but there is, I think, a, a place where your question comes in and that has to do with institutional boundary setting. Um, so for the longest time, the PGP was devoted exclusively to documents that came from two fine spots, the Ben Ezra synagogue and one of the Karaite synagogues in Cairo, right? And that was it. And, um, and I'm like, you know, whatever, you have medieval documents, bring them. So we were expanding that. And I, I think people kind of are looking askance, like you're, you're sullying, you know, the purity of your, of your Cairo Geniza project. You know, for me, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's all, it's all good. Um, and then from the other perspective, um, I've been doing some work with um, DPL, Digital Princeton University Library, which is like, you know, a lot of libraries have these repositories now where you can curate, um, curate data sets or curate um, even, you know, whatever, like important conglomerations of material, whether or not they're, they're from the library and that whether or not they're from the library is a very interesting question. So um, I ended up bringing 43,000 Geniza fragments from the um, Jewish Theological Seminary, their images into Deepol because JTS is limited in terms of what it can do by way of digitization. And my colleagues in the Princeton Library were just absolutely incredible. They were like, no questions asked. Like, you want us to host it? We'll host it, great. And we'll help you like, you know, build the, build the site. You know, in some cases that could result in double digitization, right? Who cares is the point. To quote my colleague, Will Noel, um, who is head of special collections at Princeton now, but I know him from when he was at Penn and he was a real kind of pioneer of this stuff, data should be promiscuous, right? So your data can live in several places at the same time, that's okay. You're not gonna like create alternate recensions that shouldn't make you nervous. You know, somebody might come along who's gonna do something amazing with your data that you never could have envisioned, let them download it. Like have a button on your website where you could just download all the data and do whatever you want with it. I think that's when, um, you know, that, that's one way of at least broadening what we do. Uh, I completely concur with uh, what Marina has just said. I mean, this the idea of, of uh, again, the old 19th century model of archives in which you create this possessive notion that this is ours and you have to come to us is ridiculous at every level. Uh, I think a decentered archive, in many ways, uh, replicating the internet itself, which is a web. Uh, we're working on a project with the Arab American National Museum in which because no single archive is going to be able to collect all material, nor should they, uh, of Arabs in America, for example. But what we want to do is create facility for researchers here and abroad to be able to access all this material. So we're working to create, you know, uh, basically a portal clearinghouse that guides you to wherever you want to go, and we're duplicating each other's work. So I think that kind of approach is the only way to go, you know, because we cannot keep thinking in these very siloed natures. But I love your question, Anne, and it's so good to see you. It's been really way too long. And unfortunately, all the work we did on the census to bring the MENA category disappeared with the horrendous past administration, but that's all right, Malish. We will live to fight another day. Uh, so as I said in my introductory comments, I, you know, for me personally, I think running the archive has given me a lot of latitude, I have to say. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there's no boss who tells me you can or you cannot do this. I mean, thankfully, it's, it's good. But it also puts a lot of responsibility on my shoulders and I was very conscious about issues of race, about issues of sexualities, about issues of gender. Uh, and, you know, 
we have to approach, I mean, so this, the challenge for us is a relationship with the community because ultimately the archive is driven by the community and it's a relationship with them. And the community wants to tell a story. So in many ways they are, it's a partnership, but they want to curate, right? So when, when you ask, when you do oral history collection, they just sanitize it completely. Uh, the first time I did a documentary, I was asking them, this is folks who lived in North Carolina in the 19, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, Jim Crow South. And I said, so what about race? And it's just like, it took forever to get it out of them. I mean, they just don't want to talk about race at both levels. One, that they are, you know, subject to race. And finally, one person, you know, told me, yeah, they told me to go to the back of the bus because I have kinky hair and dark skin. Uh, but also race in which they become whitewashed themselves and they become mainstream as to, to gain access to the pro white privilege. And so they don't want to talk about it, but it's something that, you know, we constantly push the boundaries that you're talking about. Uh, uh, also in terms of gender, I just shared our new virtual exhibit about uh, early Arab American uh, cultural producers. Originally it was celebrated the centenary of Arabit al Qalamiya, but we also, you know, discovered because somebody wanted us to just do Arabit al Qalamiya, a group of men who are early Arab American writers. And they're great. But I said, look, you know, I'm not just gonna write about men. I mean, there are a lot of women who are creative artists themselves and producers. And so we pushed very hard to do that. So I think you have to be very conscious about it and about the bias that of where we're getting. So I, in other words, just because somebody gives me something uh, doesn't mean that it fulfills my vision for this. We're always welcoming, we're a new archive. So quite honestly, let me be very honest. If somebody wants to hand me something, I'll say, sure, I'll take it. You know, uh, but as you also said, and just because it's digitized doesn't mean it's endless. It's very exhausting. It's a lot of work, you know, so uh, we have to, you know, limit things. But at the same time, I go out and I ask them, ask them, what about this? What about that? So, I mean, I think you have to be very conscious about this collection because I really worry. I, I honestly constantly worry about the silence of the archive, about the voices that are not heard in the archive and about how the archive simply double oppresses people by simply excluding them, you know? Uh, so one of the things is we're looking at the queer history of these immigrants, because nobody wants to talk about queer history. It's like, hello, are you freaking kidding me? So we have this fantastic character that we're highlighting in this exhibit who takes upon herself the title princess, Rahme Haida. I mean, she, she claims to descend from 2000 years of royalty. She's from Balbuk, you know? Uh, and she's just this fantastic character. And, you know, very likely, I mean, we don't have, certainly, but she had a partner, a female partner for 35 years, very likely lesbian, but, you know, we highlight her. So, I mean, I think this becomes an effort for us to really problematize that history and shake it up. Uh, and it's difficult at times because we're pushing, not so much, I guess, administrators and our colleagues, we're pushing against the community that gets a little upset with us. In fact, I had people yell at me uh, because I talked about, you know, a queer immigrants. I was giving a talk and I was highlighting some elements and you know, they were very upset. Uh, so I think that's where the challenge is for me anyway. Thank you, thank you for the question. And um, Pishan, you have a question. We will get you sorted out. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. I think this is, this is really cool. Um, I'm a software engineer working with uh, Arabic, English, Mandarin translation systems. Um, I'm also a student at Kiva right now studying Iraq. So I'm actually approaching this from the, my training is in software engineering and physics. So a lot of this is very new to me. Um, the, the one thing, also the, the scribes of the Cairo Geniza website was uh, floating around the software engineering circles a couple months ago, which I thought was very interesting by a bunch of people who I would say are not very well read on the Middle East. So that was pretty cool. Um, and, and computer science is a pretty healthy rotating door between academia and industry in terms of research. And I'm just kind of curious is that if any of you had experiences working with local tech companies in the Middle East on some this type of stuff. Um, I know for a fact that like translation systems, for example, uh, especially with English, there's a lot of like overlap between academia and corporate the corporate research labs. I mean, I also work in a corporate research lab right now. Thanks.
So I don't actually have experience directly working with tech companies in the Middle East um, on my projects. I know that when we when you move over into um, the science division, that there's a fluidity, as you're mentioning, that between um, so particularly in the realm of um, of natural language processing, but not exclusively. Um, there's the Camel Lab that uh, Mr. Habash runs at NYUAD, and they work. I know they have notions of what it might actually mean to work, um, you know, with with all of these different companies. It's a, I think that 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 system though of the fluidity in the Middle Eastern context is actually tricky because um, I think it's I think it's probably easier to do that. Uh, in a North American context or in a European context. I'm not completely sure, but I would guess that. What I can say, though, is that there are lots of people who are definitely interested in that, uh, in that space between academia and industry as a productive one. And so one of the things that we did in RTL was we tried to move, because if you actually go to right to left, you look at RTL in GitHub, for example, there are just hundreds or Stack Overflow or whatever, you, there's just hundreds of thousands of unanswered issues about right to left uh, implementation problems. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to take that conversation to that community. And so in our recent call for papers, we actually included developers. And so we have a couple of developers who are going to be speaking at that uh, conference this year, because I think that that is the community that can actually work towards um, solving those problems, or at least bringing that academic conversation back to those communities, enriching it, and as you said, start floating the projects and the initiatives that are going on in an academic environment amongst people who care about those kinds of questions. Because I really don't believe that the developer community is all and exclusively, you know, uh, only a commercial one. I think there's so much interesting um, sort of activism and, and social engagedness that, that exists in that particular world. Thanks for the question. It's fascinating. So um, I had a chance to think about this ever so briefly because um, one of the computer science professors at Princeton, Brian Kernigan, also works for Google. And Google opened an office in Princeton, like middle of Princeton, New Jersey. I mean, you know, spitting distance from my office practically a couple of years ago. And yet I have never said, you know, I've never, I mean, you know, I haven't worked with them, I haven't worked with Google. I had some chats with Brian, they were, they were really productive and interesting. Um, but part of the reason that I haven't kind of pushed that relationship is it's not clear to me what I could bring to Google, just to use that as an example. Um, what would be interesting to software engineers, right? What would be interesting to developers? Is it, is it like the PGP as a use case or say Scribe of the Kyrgyz as a use case? Um, is it, you know, are there certain functionalities that we've um, kind of cobbled together that, that, you know, you could like take, take off with? Is it the source material? Is it the UX stuff? Like if, if I think if the, if the computer people made it clearer to us what is interesting to them, right, about what we do, that would also make it easier. Uh, so very quickly, and I, I am afraid I have to leave exactly at two for another meeting. Our lives are on Zoom these days, so I apologize in advance. Uh, I would want to stay here and talk to all of you because this is just so much fun. Uh, and I'm learning so much from Marina and David as we speak. I have two experiences working with corporate uh, elements, one positive and one not so positive. So uh, when we first started this Arabic optical character recognition project, as I said, we have this collection of Arab American newspapers who were digitized and we're continuing to digitize, but I wanted to make it searchable. So I went around looking, you know, we tested our commercial products and the recognition rate was somewhere around between one and 0%. It was just not working well at all. It was very awful. And so we thought, okay, we have dealt with it. You know, so we started playing around with it. And then, you know, there was a, this brilliant PhD student working here and she came up uh, many of you know, uh, you know, uh, things like Tesseract and, and Kraken, these, you know, open source, uh, you know, AI in essence, uh, learning uh, uh, programs, but you have to train them. And so the student, PhD student, figure out an algorithm in which rather than having, you know, 100,000 manually entered data points to train Tesseract on particular TypeScript, so it recognizes it, uh, we only had to do about 70 uh, lines and on those 70 lines, we can produce 100,000 data points within half an hour. So, I mean, it was a really wonderful breakthrough in terms of the algorithm. Uh, she's really, she went on to bigger and better things doing computer vision for Apple, actually. Uh, 
so obviously when we approach the, you know company about you know funding some of the project which means funding a phd student the first thing they wanted is they wanted to acquire proprietary rights to the algorithm and i said there's no way i can give you that a it's not mine b the whole it defeats the whole purpose of this project so I mean, I think that's one of the issues that really is the tension between the needs and interests of a, of a you know corporate world and ours. I recognize they need to make money. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but there's a limit there. But second is a more positive one, in which and this is an answer to a certain extent to Marina, in which well, they with this one particular uh, group, uh, they're looking for us because we want to develop handwritten recognition, text recognition, the next stage, and we have data. We have lots and lots of that data, right? And so for them, their interest is uh, humanities experience, that is how to interpret the data, but also a lot of data that they could use in this regard. So I think we do bring to the table something very important about this, uh, you know, in terms of, I mean, I, I can't sit there and tell them about segmentation or, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, you know, math, mathematical genius. So I can't tell them how to segment marginalia because people write to the side or overflow which is the challenge of handwritten, but I can work with them because I have the language skills. And so I think that's one of the things they're interested in and hopefully they're gonna provide some funding. And they were very willing, by the way, to say, yes, absolutely, it's open source. We will not make it proprietary, whatever we develop. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, heteromist like everything else. But uh, I do think, and this is what David was uh, speaking with, uh, in terms of the Middle East, I don't, we haven't had a good, good luck with, with, with the relationships there. We tried working with Sakhar, Many of you have heard of Sakhar, it's a Kuwaiti organization that really started OCR in the 80s. Uh, they, are, they were impossible to, to even get hold of, let alone to work with. We tried working with a group of programmers in Lebanon, partly because we wanted to provide funding for people who are struggling. Uh, and that was hit or miss in many ways, partly because, and I have to say it's because as Marina was saying, we're just not trained to know when people are being productive. I mean, I don't know the language. There's a language barrier that I have to say we need to overcome in which we have to learn the language so that when they speak, I understand them. And when I speak, they understand me. And there has to be a translation thing process going on with the tech industry that, you know, in some ways it should be required training for our graduate students now. Uh, programming code. I mean, they, they, I, mean I, I actually brought this to the, my history department saying we need not only to tell them to do digital humanities, we need to actually take computer science courses. So at least they learn what it means to code because that's learning, that's working in a foreign language. And to them just, and so I think that's a challenge that I'm constantly dealing with. Anyway, I apologize. This is so wonderful to see you all. And thank you for the opportunity, Jim, but I do have to jump on another call. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Akram. Thank you, Akram, so much. I think we do have some other questions. No. Yes, I, I got a couple of uh, anonymous questions. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I got a couple of anonymous questions through the chat. I might, thought I might just uh, sort of pose those and we'll have a round and then we might uh, move to the, the post game scenario <laughs> uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, I, I got a couple of very interesting anonymous questions that I, I'm going to assume uh, are, are both from uh, uh, listeners uh, from the Gulf uh, that were particularly interested in uh, the challenges to equity in doing digital work across boundaries uh, within the Gulf uh, and also in more authoritarian contexts where, uh, you know, not just, you know, the archive becomes a sensitive political uh, document, but also the, the, you know, work like oral history, work that is dealing with contemporary you know, human subjects that put themselves at risk. Likewise, with scholars who are in, in not only contingent positions, but in working in contexts where you know, they are putting themselves at risk by even doing some of this work, and whether or not the digital humanities work that we're doing is either amplifying those risks or uh, you know, potentially liberating people from them in some way. Um, I, I thought I might just uh, throw that uh, question out there that sort of threads two, two together. Marina, do you want to take that first or do you want to speak to that? This is all you. Okay, <laughs> right. So this is, I mean, this is a, this is the million dollar question, right? I mean, archives have always been 
the problem in some ways. They're both what we want to have to read, we want to know about, we want to, but they're also the things that are burnt down and that they're the things that are delo dislo you know, dislocated, like extracted and taken away. So, you know, I think, I mean, so an archives also, the power of archives change with time. Um, right. And so I think that, you know, one of the things that we see in certainly in uh, cultural studies and social justice turn in digital humanities that we've seen recently is that people are starting to use um, the tools of the digital for things which are very, very um, contemporary. Right. And they're starting to use them for um, questions that the rest of the humanities have been interested in. So I think that's that's, that's definitely present. And yet at the same time, one of the tricky things about uh, Middle East studies, right, is that Middle East studies has a, definitely has in it different camps of people who are pre-modern or who are contemporary, who are, and so those also, you know, when we come to the question of what uh, a digital project can do, um, I, we are, we also have different, um, we have different expectations and different audiences. What I can say is that there is, you know, the, that digital archive production is not just a means of opening things up to people, but it can also be, right, from the beginning, a curatorial act or practice, right, is that if you put things out there into the world, and this goes back to what Akram said, I think, right, if you put things out into the world, you can tell a narrative indirectly, or you can guide a narrative, like an archive or an infrastructure can have in it a theoretical premise that guides future debate, right? And so you can create a world and we, we know we can count them. We know the places in the Middle East that have digital archives and Akram's question about the, the, the transnational communities um, of the Leban Libano Syrianese that the uh, Syrians, sorry, Syrian, sorry, I got all caught in my the Lebanese and Syrian and Turkish, whatever they we want to call them, communities who now live and have lived it for a long time in the United States, their reaction to um, the original stories that uh, or the materials that are included in that archive. Um, that's one thing. Um, but uh, you also have, if you look at the landscape now, the Emirates, Qatar, um, Kuwait, there are lots of materials that could be that could be archived. Now, I, one of the things that I'd like to just say that's interesting here is that there are, and I'm going to be talking about this at the RTL conference with my colleague, um, Mandra Sabah from Zayed University, that we're going to be also talking about archiving practices in the Middle East that are what we might call unofficial archival practices, is where the infrastructural gap um, that exists in that part of the world has impeded people, or perhaps maybe not impeded, that maybe that's the wrong way of putting it, has not it has meant that there are there are not easy ways of archiving. And so what you have is you have families or you have uh, important families or business organizations, whatever, that have lots and lots of documents that want to push them out into the world. Um, and they do that, and they do that via social media. And it's a highly curated and monetized um, environment where people are kind of dealing in documents, right? Um, and both putting out um, versions of, um, of Past and sort of selling um, some of the uh, more valuable objects in the version of the past that really doesn't match our uh, research-based university notion of, of how an archive builds itself, right? So it's a very complex, uh, it's a very, very complex um, 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 uh, uh, landscape. Uh, in the contemporary Middle East um, it, that really divides Mashraki countries from Gulf countries, um, certainly from if you if we look, if we extend uh, on the other side of the Gulf to Iran, et cetera. It's a it's a very uh, variegated and unequal landscape of archives that are being used in lots of different ways nowadays. So I'll just add one small thing to that if I can, um, which is it, every archive has its kind of oral history, local knowledge. Um, so just to take you know, an example at the Bibliothèque Nationale, if you wanted to look at a Hebrew manuscript, you used to have to go with a list of five things, the first three of which you had no interest in seeing whatsoever. And then the ones that you wanted to see were numbers four and five, and you'd hand it to the librarian and they'd only give you numbers four and five. That was the trick, but you had to know, somebody had to tell you. So there are amazing archives and libraries in Egypt, obviously. Um, 
accessing them is not completely straightforward. It depends a lot what you're looking for. It depends what you wanna see. And you absolutely have to talk to people. That's just like the first rule in historical studies is before you go to the archive, talk to people who've worked in the archive. And that applies whether you're in an authoritarian context or a democratic context, it's, you know, that's really the rule. So you know, this goes back to what we were saying about with, right? It's all about the local partnerships. So, we're a little bit over two. We're going to um, stop the recording in just a minute. I do have one more question that I just wanted to pose. I'm going to assume that um, I think Akram almost left us with his answer. And the question is just, I think there's threads of that you guys have answered this, but I'm just going to repose it of in the next five years, right? If, if, the, if the title of this panel is kind of the futures of and insert all of your prepositions and whatever digital scholarship, digital humanities, um, you know, what will happen or what do you think is maybe some of the most important things that need to change in terms of the classroom, in terms of mentoring students and research, um, this Zoom reality of post COVID that hopefully we're entering into in the fall collaboration, structures of the university. So I guess I was just kind of as a closing thought in the next five years, if you guys might flag something um, from something that you've already mentioned or something you kind of want to leave the audience with. And let me just add in, I think Akram, he, he left us with the everybody, all everybody in the humanities needs to learn coding, computer language to kind of address this Grand Canyon rift between um, the two sides. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, the thing that I would like to see happen in the next five years is for there to be more openness to, first of all, collaborative work, um, but collaborative work that you can also do for a grade, right? That, that all of the metrics that we have are based on individuals doing work off on their own in their monk cell. And that's just like, you know, what reality <laughs> is this inhabiting? Um, and, and the other thing is, um, I can't remember what the other thing was, but maybe I'll come back to it later. Yeah, so that, that's a big, wide open question. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Um, I guess I would say, I mean, what I've seen, so I, we started this question of first when we were, when I was working at AUB and um, certainly now at NYOW, and now I'm starting to see lots of different poles of what I would call the beginnings of um, digital. Uh, and I, I, I'm gonna just say it, digital approaches to the historical humanities uh, as opposed to digital humanities, right? Um, or digital approaches to the historical record. Um, they're, they're, I think we're starting to see more and more of this. So there's a, a, it's popped up at AUC. Um, they're doing really interesting things in special collections. Um, I gave a digital methods seminar recently for a group of faculty at Zayed University in, Abu Dhabi, in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and that just kind of like exploded. So it's one of these things where I really do see um, that we will move towards more digital uh, research on the historical humanities in the region. Now, what the relationship of that digital historical research in the humanities will be to the development of digitality in general and to digital societies and digital economies in the region, that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, that's a really hard one for me to say. I can say that one of the things I think that is really, really, really going to change um, in the next five years is accessibility to language and to language processing um, for the, the right to left Arabic script um, or just right to left languages in general. And I think that part of that is gonna take place via what people like Akram and myself have already been thinking about already, which is um, machine learning based collaborations with human knowledge, with human um, and humanistic knowledge. And so I think we're gonna see archives become much more searchable. I think we're gonna be, I think, so something, take something like uh, Arabic collections online, which really can just be downloaded, but can't be searched, um, or um, the newspapers that Akram worked on. I think that will, be, that will open up. Right, that will be that will be very very different looking in five years. As to the question of the infrastructures, that's a harder one, I think, because you know, and I I, I think a lot about this, which is what will happen to infrastructures, and I believe that what we're going to see are smaller poles of that kind of human technical 
capacity um, that emerge um, probably in university environments and probably in just to speak to May's question in the chat to privileged university environments that is the sort of American style or GCC universities I think you're going to see that and, and what I would hope is that there would be intra-regional cooperations right as opposed to only <laughs> Metropolitan and uh, and 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 periphery kinds of participation, but I don't know that that will actually take place. So my my vision of the next five years is definitely some interesting technical advances that will take you towards uh, a much deeper understanding of archives that are written in those languages or digitized materials in those languages. But for the other, what the landscape will actually look like, how people interact with each other, and how people work towards common goals, I'm not sure about that. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way that the the geopolitical situation of the region um, plays out. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I want to make sure that we keep as much as possible to our, our recorded time uh, and just thank uh, Akram unfortunately had to go a little early, but thank you, David. Thank you, Marina. And thank you, Jared, uh, for everything you were able to offer today. I want to also thank, uh, again, our co-sponsors, Duke UNC, uh, Consortium for Middle East Studies in 19 Washington Square North, and it was great to see you, and thank you for that question. 